I'm very excited to be introducing our next speaker, uh, Professor Jay Wexler, uh, who has been teaching at Boston University School of Law since 2001, after he clerked for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and after working for the Department of Justice. Uh, I'm particularly excited uh, that Professor Wexler is speaking here today uh, because I attended BU Law School from 2009 to 2012, uh, where Jay was uh, my professor for three courses on legislation, environmental law, and administrative law. And although he graded me a flat B in two of those three courses, <laughs> he uh, remains hands down my favorite uh, law professor. Uh, you'll soon see why uh, when you experience his natural charisma firsthand. Uh, in addition to teaching law, Professor Wexler is the author of the Twitter handle SCOTUS Humor which tracks the number of laughs uh, each Supreme Court justice receives during oral arguments, uh, with a running tally for each term. Uh, that seriously might be his best known work. Uh, it, it has been covered on the front page of the New York Times, as well as the Washington Post, NPR, and uh, I believe Jake Tapper interviewed him uh, for ABC's Nightline about it. Uh, that said, Jay is also an accomplished author with six books, uh, three of which I've read, the Cliff Notes version online, uh, because they pertain to state church separation. Uh, seriously, though, uh, I have read his books. Uh, they're funny, witty, irreverent, uh, and written by a man who is truly passionate for the subject matter. Uh, you can find out more about his books uh, and his other work um, at his website, uh, which also features a gallery of his artwork, uh, that's jwex.com. Uh, we have one of his books here, uh, and Jay has kindly indicated that he'll sign copies of that newest book of his. Uh, it's called Our Non-Christian Nation, How Atheists, Satanists, Pagans, and Others Are Demanding Their Rightful Place in Public Life. Uh, he'll be signing that book at noon along with our upcoming speakers, uh, Steve Pinker and FFRF's own Andrew Seidel. So uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome Professor Jay Wexler. I'll be uh, talking to the registrar about r retroactively changing the grades. Uh, <laughs> Not sure if that's a policy that we... Uh, so good morning, everybody. I mean, this is spectacular. Look at all the... There's so many people here. It's amazing. Uh, I'm, and it's, I'm so happy and I'm so hopeful seeing this, uh, this auditorium or ballroom filled with so many people uh, uh, to, 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 to attend this conference. And, and, and the lineup that FFRF has put together, have you seen that? I mean, not this talk, but, you know, like after, uh, I told my wife, like, who's speaking? And she's like, what? <laughs> Margaret Atwood? Wow. Um, anyways, it's always a pleasure, uh, it's always a pleasure and, and a privilege to speak at an FFRF event. And it's particularly thrilling to talk about my 2019 book, uh, Non-Christian Nation, because the Freedom From Religion Foundation and its members are really one of the major heroes of the book. Uh, indeed, the book is dedicated to the courageous plaintiffs uh, who have fought for separation of church and state, and many of those plaintiffs, and of course their lawyers, are here today in the ballroom. It's like a who's who of, of extremely important plaintiffs in big cases. I see Linda Stevens there, who is the plaintiff uh, in town of Greece. Uh, David Williamson, I think, right, is a, a, a plaintiff in, in, the, in, in the Brevard County, Williamson versus Brevard County case. Dan Barker, of course, is a plaintiff um, in, bar, in, a, in a case challenging the House of Representatives policy about chaplains. Uh, so it's really, it's really a thrill. It's just not often that one gets to talk about a book to those who inspired the book. And so it's just a thrill and a joy to be here. So what I'm going to do is talk briefly about the book um, and, uh, and then mention a few recent developments that have postdated the book that we can then either talk about in a little question and answer uh, period after, or we can talk about in other parts uh, of the convention. 
The book um, grew out of two straightforward facts about the United States, neither of which I think will surprise anybody here. The first fact is that for the, in the past 25 years, the Supreme Court has really smashed down whatever wall of separation between church and state uh, it used to, it used to, it used to uh, uh, support. R basically rendering the Establishment Clause in many ways practically a dead letter and vastly increasing religious, uh, religion's access to government property, government money, government institutions. The last time, I just taught my uh, students this the other day, the last time the Supreme Court struck something down under the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment was 2005. So that's a, that's a long time. Um, now, how has it done this? What, in what areas has the Supreme Court uh, uh, acted in this way? Four main areas that I talk about in the book that are uh, of uh, extreme importance, I think. First of all is funding of religion. Uh, as a result of the 2002 case called Zellman, which involved the Cleveland Voucher Program, and the 2000 case called Mitchell versus Helms, uh, and now the, the most recent Espinoza and Montana case that came out two years ago or so, uh, basically the government can funnel tons of money, billions of dollars to religion, so long as it does so in kind of formally the right way, which is pretty easy actually to do. And moreover, the government can't choose to exclude religious recipients from general, uh, general uh, uh, funding programs as a result of the new recent kind of reinvigoration of the free exercise clause, which I think is one of the biggest uh, uh, developments in separation of church and state law that we see today. Second uh, involves legislative prayer, which we've heard a little bit about already today, but the Supreme Court in 2014 in the town of Greece case um, held that town boards, as well as state and local legislatures, can start off their sessions with prayers. And not just prayers to, you know, non-sectarian prayers, which of course don't exist, but the Supreme Court likes to sometimes talk about non-sectarian prayers, so I'm just gonna keep doing this. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, I mean, anyways. Uh, there are some points in my class where I'm teaching my class, I just can't even articulate the other side. So I, this is one of those moments. Um, anyway, so uh, not only can they, can they start off with a non-sectarian prayer, they can start off with a completely sectarian prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and, uh, and, and anything else like that in, in before a legislative prayer session, uh, before a legislative session. Third context are the public schools. Previously, uh, the courts did pretty well in policing the line, I think, uh, in public schools between uh, keeping religion out in the school prayer cases, for example. But in a line of cases culminating in a case about uh, the Good News Club, which, uh, which Catherine Stewart has written quite a bit about, and she'll talk, uh, she's not talking about that later, I don't think, but she's, she'll be speaking later. Uh, the court said that, the, that, that public schools, if they open up their classrooms to, to organizations after the school day, they can't exclude religious groups from using those, uh, those classrooms and those facilities, even if those groups are proselytizing to six-year-olds and giving them candy and money uh, for remembering uh, Bible verses. And then finally, there's the context of uh, religious displays and symbols on public property. Uh, where the court has, over the past uh, uh, 20 years, basically approved so many, many of these kinds of, uh, kinds of government-supported monuments, uh, Ten Commandments in Texas. Most recently, the 40-foot cross in Maryland was upheld by the Supreme Court. Uh, I remember I went to that argument uh, because, uh, at the Supreme Court, I think because I was just the masochist and I just wanted to see, watch the Establishment Clause fall <laughs> like right in front of my face. And I just sat, sat there with open mouth as the, as the justices like debated for 70 minutes about whether a 40-foot cross is in fact a religious symbol. <laughs> I, I mean, I looked it up, you know, uh, the, the cross is 40, that's two and a half giraffes. I looked that up this morning just because I wanted to see how big the cross was in the, in the, with the units of giraffes, which are about, apparently 15 feet tall. Now, so that's the first development, is that the, the separation of church and state, the wall has really come down. The second development is a social, cultural development, which is that the United States, at the same time the Supreme Court's doing all this, uh, all this demolishing, uh, has become much more religiously diverse. Uh, as a result of Christianity's decline, as a result of the increase in the types of minority religions that we see, and of course the rise of the nuns, which, uh, where, uh, which 
the, the numbers differ, and I, I don't want to quibble so much about what the, exactly the number is, but you see anywhere from 15 to 30 percent uh, the number of how many people believe in no religion at all. So we have a growth in religious diversity and non-belief at the same time that the Supreme Court is striking, smashing down the wall of separation in church and state. So, now it's really Marco Rubio-like, I think. Um, what, uh, the natural question that follows is what should religious minorities and atheists do in a post-separation of church and state nation? Uh, there are lots of different possibilities. One possibility is continue to fight in the courts to promote separation of church and state. And of course, we have to do that. And FFRF does that better uh, than anybody, and especially uh, they, uh, I just, just listening to the, the cases that FFRF is, is litigating now, I mean, yes, if there are some baptisms in the public school, there needs to be action taken. Uh, dinosaurs, um, I don't even, how does Adam get to the top of the dinosaur? I, I, Sam, we can talk about that later, wherever you are. I'm, I'm really curious um, how he gets there to do the water slide. Um, so we got to keep fighting, uh, keep litigating in the courts, but at the same time, uh, there's only so far that can go, right, these days with our current Supreme Court, uh, which has gone, as, as you all know, very far to the right. And uh, when, I think of, when I think of Justice Amy Coney Barrett uh, replacing my former boss uh, and, uh, and, and hero on the, on the Supreme Court, I. I, like the only good thing about that is that when I'm doing community theater and I need to weep on demand, I just I think about that, and then it. But other so, but other than that, not such a good development. Um, I, I, I really fear a case is getting to the Supreme Court. Truly, I don't want the next you know school prayer case to show up on Justice Barrett's desk. I don't know what will happen if it does. So what else can people uh, can can atheists can we do? Um, well, one thing we could do is we could just give up. We could cede the public square to Christianity, right? The Supreme Court has said the, uh, the government can support Christianity in all these ways I described. Maybe we just give up and go home. I doubt anybody in this audience would, uh, would want that uh, for good reason. And so what else might we do? Well, we, what FFRF does, what we just heard about, of course, writing letters, lobbying, uh, uh, it's public education, et cetera. To, to make sure that people understand the, 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 some of the dangers of religion and some of the, 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 the goals of, of secularism. But there's one other thing that they can do, we can do, and when that is to demand equal participation in the public square alongside Christians. Right, so the Supreme Court has opened up the public square in terms of money, institutions, and property and religion, but it has also at the same time said that the government can't discriminate uh, against, uh, on the basis of what religion or non-religion people believe in. So that means that not only can Christians put up displays, but of course atheists can put up displays. Uh, we can have secular uh, organizations in the public schools proselytizing, with candy, I suppose, if necessary. Uh, so, so, that, so that is definitely a, a possibility. And it's a little counterintuitive. Like, I think for this group, it's probably not so counterintuitive. But, but at least for a long time, it, the idea that, that, that we as religious minorities or atheists should be participating in public life was, that's not what we wanted to do, right? We wanted to keep religion and, and the government and the public square separate and have a secular public square. So it's kind of strange in a way, and there's, you gotta get over the, the hump that, 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 look, we're stuck with religion participating in the public square, so the only thing we can really do to count, not the only thing, but one of the main things we can do to counter it is to participate alongside Christians. And indeed, religious minorities and atheists have started doing exactly that. And that's what much of the book is. It's about telling the stories. It's about telling your stories in many ways. Um, the stories, uh, many of the stories in the book involve religious minorities. Uh, there's a story about a Muslim school in North Carolina, for example, that participates in that state's voucher program. A school, that was a school which saw three of its graduates shot to death in a hate crime uh, not all that long ago, a hate crime that made national news. 
There's the story of a, a wife of a Wiccan war hero who, with the help of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, sued to get the Wiccan Pentacle approved by the Veterans Administration for placement on the National Cemetery gravestones. And now, if you go to the National Cemetery in Washington, D.C., there are at least eight uh, um, headstones with the Wiccan, Wiccan Pentacle, and people, uh, Wiccans from Northern Virginia, sometimes go around on Memorial Day to do rituals at each of those graves. There's the story in the book of how I went to Belle Plaine, Minnesota. I don't know if anyone, I, I'm guessing no one from here is from Belle Plaine, Minnesota. Well, yeah, really? <laughs> I do the Belle Plaine dance. Um, Belle Plaine was about, this tiny town in, in, uh, in Minnesota, was about to be the, 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 the town where uh, the very first satanic monument on public property was going to be erected. So I went there to go see if, see if that was going to happen. And in fact, what, in, what happened is that the town uh, actually closed down their free speech zone rather than allow uh, a, a satanic veterans monument to be next to a bunch of you know, crosses in their Veterans Memorial Park. The most interesting thing about that trip actually was when I sat in that park, just kind of contemplating what was going on, and then I saw a lady, she just started walking around the park, and I was wondering what she was doing, I was wondering if she, I had no idea, but then I saw she was sprinkling holy water around the whole park, and I just sat there watching, and then she looked at me and I went, hi, and she went, hi. That's the story. Um, and then, of course, there's the story of, uh, of efforts by, by atheists, by secularists, often led by or helped by the Freedom From Religion Foundation, including the, uh, the, the 1,500 pound American atheist bench in Florida. I have this ongoing debate with, uh, with a film director, Penny Lane, who directed the Hail Satan movie, which you may know about. But she, she uh, though an atheist, hates the idea of an atheist bench. She thinks it's boring. But I think the atheist bench is awesome, because like, you can sit in it. There's like something you can do with it, right? Should we have a vote? No, let's not do that. Um, there's, uh, there, there are all of the uh, secular invocations that have been given before town boards uh, by, by the fantastic uh, CFFC in Central Florida, David Williamson's group, Linda Stevens did a, 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 a fabulous uh, uh, secular invocation in front of the same town that she took to the Supreme Court, which I thought was one of the bravest things I've ever see seen. Um, uh, the, the, of course, the FFRF holiday displays, we saw a picture of that, the nativity displays with, with Benjamin Franklin and the Statue of Liberty. I've been told that with, I, by growing my hair out in the pandemic that I look a little like Benjamin Franklin. So if you ever need a, like a live version of that, I'm happy to stand in the Iowa Capitol Rotunda for a week. Now, sometimes these events uh, go really smoothly. Um, uh, at, at Linda's invocation, I went to the town of Greece, and I secretly hoped that there would be kind of some hullabaloo that I could kind of report on, like you know. But luck, really, luckily, looking back on it, there was not, and it was very peaceful. The only thing I, I mentioned in the book, I was sitting next to a guy, and while well, uh, when Linda was introduced, the town board guy said, "There's now will be a prayer." And then, it, and then the guy sitting next to me took off his baseball hat, which was a Red Sox hat, incidentally, which was surprising. And, and then when it was clear that it wasn't going to be an actual prayer, he put the hat back on. That was the extent of the controversy there. So sometimes these things go very smoothly. But of course, as you can imagine and know from, from, uh, from all of FFRF's work, it, oftentimes they don't go smoothly. Uh, and I tell the, some stories in the book about that. There are stories, for example, of invocations being shouted down, uh, counter invocations being given, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, displays being torn down, ripped down. Uh, there's, there's the story of uh, legislators in Louisiana who supported a voucher program until they learned that there were such things as Muslim schools, in which, at which point they decided, but well, we better get rid of that voucher program. Um, uh, so, so sometimes the stories are actually quite, uh, quite um, unfortunate, which I don't think will surprise anybody. Now, although most of the book is descriptive, uh, it also puts forth a normative argument, I think, uh, that this kind of participation in public life, while in a sense kind of a second best to the ideal secular public square, 
uh, nevertheless has some real positives, I think, that, 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 that minorities might not get from that kind of secular public square. For example, um, having a religious cacophony, that's how I envision it in the public square, where you have Christians talking about what they want and, and Jews talking about what they believe and, and atheists saying what they believe and the Satanists and the, and the Wiccans and everybody talking about what you know, they believe the, the good life looks like. I find that, that you know, that's, that's kind of exciting in a way to me. Um, some of, I'm sure some of you would disagree, but I like the idea of this pluralism in public life is very attractive. And I also think that it's educative, um, right? I, I think it was uh, David Williamson who told me uh, in a conversation that, 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 uh, that doing an invocation right before a meeting uh, as a secularist gives you sort of a two minute you know, lecture opportunity to, to both model uh, how atheists are not scary and to teach uh, pe people who might be afraid uh, of, of atheists that uh, what, what we believe in. And this is in, in front of an audience that is necessarily uh, involved, civically involved uh, and, and, and interested in governing. So, so there's an educative benefit to participating in the public square. And maybe, maybe also over time, we might see more mutual understanding and tolerance and respect. The other possibility, of course, is that you have something like what happened in, uh, in, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, when the Satanic Temple decided they were going to give an invocation, uh, and, and the town in, in decided, or the city, after a three-hour really, really uh, hard to watch meeting uh, where the entire city of Phoenix came out to denounce uh, the Satanic Temple, even though they didn't know what the Satanic Temple was. Uh, they closed down the, the school, the, 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 the invocation program altogether, kind of like the, the Bell Plain Park, rather than let a Satanist talk for two minutes once a year. And so you get the secular public square anyway. So that's the argument of the book and the description uh, contained in the book. And now let me just talk about three developments that have uh, occurred since, uh, since I wrote the book. And maybe you'll find them interesting. Um, uh, uh, we'll see. And maybe we can talk about it. I hope that we have about eight minutes or so of, of, of question and answer after. The, the first development is a really uh, troubling one. And that is the exclusion in some jurisdictions of atheists from invocation programs. Um, right, so so it's true that the, t the Supreme Court in town of Greece said that the go that the government can't discriminate on the basis of religion when it lets people give o opening prayers, but some uh, jurisdi jurisdictions, including the United States House of Representatives, has said, well, okay, other religions can pray, but atheists can't pray because atheists can't pray. And, um, and this has happened in a few jurisdictions. It happened in the 11th Circuit, it happened in the 3rd Circuit, and the DC Circuit. And FFRF was involved in the litigation uh, uh, of may maybe all of those cases, but certainly the DC Circuit case in which uh, a judge that I had clerked for before I worked for RBG, uh, David Tatel, actually came out in favor of the government, which is, was so disturbing to me. The idea that the government could exclude atheists from this pluralistic uh, uh, public square just because atheists don't believe in a higher power is deeply uh, troubling and really undermines the religious pluralism possibility that is the only silver lining, in my view, of the Supreme Court's new Establishment Clause jurisprudence. Second development, and, and this, uh, uh, um, Sam mentioned this case already, a case called Shirtlift. That's, this is the Boston flag case, which is at the Supreme Court now. And it's going to be a really interesting case. It's very, very much uh, of a piece of the, of the cases that I talk about in the book. Um, the, just quickly, a little bit more facts on that, on that case. The city of Boston has these three flagpoles right in front of the city hall. One has the U.S. flag, one has the state flag, and the other has the city flag. And sometimes the city flies a private group's, a civic organization's flag in conjunction with an event that that group does on city hall. And a Christian group said, can we put up our flag? Uh, and, the, and the city said, no, it's not consistent with our sort of guidelines. And then the lawsuit occurred. It's a, from a free speech First Amendment uh, perspective, it's a really, really interesting and difficult case because it turns on whether those flags are the government speaking, in which case the government can say, we're not putting up a cross, or whether it's the government facilitating a forum for private speech, in which case then the government maybe has to put up the Christian 
uh, flag. But if it does, and if that's what the Supreme Court rules, I'm really hoping that the Freedom From Religion Foundation has a flag, because that's what we need to do on day two, right, is to put that up. And, and finally, I just want to say a word about the, the, the Supreme Court's reinvigoration of the free exercise clause. In the last couple of years, we've seen this right-turning uh, uh, court really uh, push the free exercise clause, find that religious believers have, uh, have rights to exemptions from various general laws and other things like that, recent cases involving things called the ministerial exception, um, and the Fulton case from last year, you, some of you might know about, and those, all those COVID cases, which the court is deciding on a shadow docket with no oral argument. Um, all those cases represent a new reinvigorated free exercise clause. And we can debate about what the, what the proper interpretation of the free exercise clause may be, but the point I wanna make here is that whatever you think about that, the, it's certainly the case that reinvigorating the free exercise clause at the same time that the court is demolishing the establishment clause, right, puts the religion clauses out of balance. If we're going to uh, allow religion to be exempt from some general laws, and that maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, but if we are, then religion should, should then also bear the burden of needing to be excluded from government programs on the other hand to balance the two rights. And so we don't, we often talk about the two clauses in isolation from each other, but I think we ought to be talking about them together. And if the court is gonna demolish the establishment clause, it doesn't make any sense for it to reinvigorate the free exercise clause at the same time. And I think we need to keep making that point. So that's all I have. Um, I have five minutes and 54 seconds left uh, and would be happy to answer uh, as many questions as possible in those five minutes and 47 seconds. <laughs> if anyone has a question. Hello, thank you, Mr. Uh, Wexler. Um, I know you share already your kind of general idea, but uh, do you have some, I, I'm sure you must have some specific ideas how you can implement um, practically this uh, idea and strategy, strategy. Do you have some specific kind of um, suggestions, advice, how it could be implemented? Well, sure. I mean, I think that, that FFRF and other groups are, are doing uh, this uh, already by putting, so, so the, the, th the four areas I was talking about, you could talk about each one of those. So, the, so uh, religious minorities and atheists could put up displays like they have. They could give invocations like they have. They could start uh, after school um, uh, clubs, the Secular Student Alliance. That's a very uh, a prominent and growing and excellent group that helps students, secular students in high schools and colleges to start their own sort of versions of the Good News Club, although uh, better. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the fourth um, area is, is money. And I wonder whether, uh, whether atheist groups have, uh, have applied for public funds to run, for example, substance abuse uh, programs. That, that seems like an area where, where we could do more and where religious minorities and atheists could seek to get government money and use it to promote their own, uh, our own substantive mes message of non-religion. Thank you. Hi, Jay, I'm Ellery Shemp. I was wondering if you could say something about uh, whether the, the, the uh, uh, putting the establishment clause in second place behind the free exercise clause, is, does that? Does that represent something of a Catholic-Protestant divide, or is that, what is the role of the evangelical movement in, in promoting freedom of religion or free exercise versus the establishment? Uh, oh, thank you for that question. So, uh, for the, I mentioned earlier that um, that the, 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 the room was filled with amazing plaintiffs and church state cases, and Ellery Shemp is, uh, needs just a round of applause for being one of the first. And the uh, the landmark case uh, 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 that that didn't kick prayer out of the schools, but but stopped government sponsored prayers. I actually tell my class. You you asked me a question at a different conference one day, and I tell my students that that you did, and I got really scared, and they laugh, and I'm scared again. Um, <laughs> But no, to answer your question, uh, Mr. Shum, uh, I, so I don't, I don't, I, I don't really claim to know to have any 
real, uh, uh, my po political instincts are terrible. So I don't, I, it's hard for me to, ex to, to, to know, you know, I assume the evangelical movement is behind uh, all of these free exercise clause movement uh, 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 litigation strategies. I think Project Blitz is probably an example of that. Catherine Stewart would certainly know more about that than I do, but it's got to be the case that that's true. And and but they've already sort of won on the establishment clause side in a way, right? So so um, so maybe it's partially that, right? And 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 the free exercise clause that jur that jurisprudence has always been in flux, right? Um, uh, it, it, from from the early days of Reynolds to to the to the Smith case of 1990 and RIFRA after that and state RIFRAs and so so there's a lot of movement in that area and I think evangelicals can uh, probably look at, have looked at that and say we can take advantage of this because it's, there's not a lot of hard strong precedent here and with this new court we're going to be able to get what what we want so just some speculation but thank you so much. Okay, so I'm told that we need to stop. Uh, I apologize. I'm sorry, we could, I hopefully we'll get to speak uh, at other parts uh, of the conference. But thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to the rest of the conference.